Hi, and welcome back to our channel Summaries of a Bookworm. Your number one place for all who need or like to listen to book summaries. Let's start with the book summary of today. In Between the World and Me, the author, Ta-Nehisi Coates, writes a long letter to his son, Samori. In this long letter, Coates talks about his own life as a black man in a country that was built on putting black people down. Coates starts by thinking back to the interview he gave on a popular news show the Sunday before. During the interview, the reporter asked Coates to explain why he thought that looting and violence were the foundations of America's progress. He was upset because he thinks it's very clear that America was built on slavery and genocide, and that racism is what keeps it going. Coates thinks that asking him why he thinks this is like asking about the condition of his body, his black body, which carries the weight of centuries of slavery, oppression, violence, and racism. That interviewer's question made him sad because she was asking him to wake her up from the dream, big, beautiful houses with white picket fences and happy homes full of peppermint and strawberry shortcake. This American dream is built on the backs of black people and other minority groups. His son was 15 years old when Coates sat down to write this letter. It was the year that Eric Garner was choked to death, the year that police killed 12-year-old Tamir Rice in a drive-by shooting and the year that the people who killed Michael Brown were not punished. Coates doesn't say trite things to his son. Instead, he tells his son that this is his country and that, like him, his son will have to learn to deal with the weight of this fact. In the 1980s, Coates grew up on the streets of Baltimore. He never fit in with the tough, violent kids who hung out on street corners and played music, sold drugs and beat people up to show who was boss. He couldn't understand or speak their violent language, and he couldn't react quickly enough to their moves to defend himself. He tried to avoid those kids most of the time. To be black in the Baltimore where I grew up was to be exposed to the elements of the world, he writes. When Coates was in the sixth grade, a boy showed him a gun, put it in his pocket, and then showed it to him again. Coates will never forget this moment. Coates learned how to act tough on the streets, but it was all a show. In reality, he wanted to get away. Coates didn't like school because he thought of it as a prison, but he was smart and looked up to Malcolm X. He wanted to be as smart and in charge of himself as Malcolm X. His father worked as a research librarian at Howard University, which he called, the Mecca. When Coates went to Howard University, he was amazed by how different the students were. There were math geniuses, African aristocrats, Muslims, rappers, and writers, among others. When Coates got there, Chancellor Williams's Destruction of Black Civilization was his favorite book. He read about the long and complicated history of Central Africa. He read about Queen Nzinga, who ruled in the 1600s and showed off her power by telling a servant to kneel on all fours like a chair. It wasn't until one of his classes that he realized he was that servant, the back on which the American Empire stood. He learned that black history was not simple or uniform. For example, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes often disagreed, W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey were at odds, and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. had different ideas about peace. Hip-hop artists used words and guns to fight. Coates's deep, lifelong love of different kinds of black art led him to love art in general. Coates enjoyed poems. He taught himself how to cook. He fell in love more than once, and then he started to write, mostly about music. He finally found his calling as a reporter. Then, right before he left Howard, he fell in love with his future wife, a girl from Chicago. Coates became a father at the age of 24. He named his son after Samori Touré, who fought against French colonial rule in West Africa. After he quit Howard, he moved to Maryland's Prince George's, PG, County. PG County was known to be dangerous, and it still is. People knew that the police officers used too much force, and even though the FBI looked into it many times, the violent officers were rarely reprimanded and almost never brought to justice. Coates was pulled over by a police officer one night and asked for his ID. The officer let him go, but Coates was still afraid all the time. The police in PG County could not be stopped and could kill him at any time. In September of that year, Coates read an article in the Washington Post about yet another police shooting. His friend Prince Jones had been killed by an officer who said Jones had tried to run him off the road, even though Jones had not done anything like that. Earlier that day, the police officer had been told to find an African-American drug dealer who was 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed 250 pounds. Jones, who was 6 feet tall and weighed 211 pounds, didn't fit the description at all, but the officer still followed him from PG County to Northern Virginia and shot him just yards from his girlfriend's house. This made Coates very sad. He started looking into the past of police violence in PG County. He grew angrier and angrier. 
Then, just two months before September 11, 2001, he moved his family to New York City. Coates slowly made a name for himself as a writer in New York City. He worked as a freelancer and made very little money, but over time he built up a portfolio of work while his wife paid the bills. One day, a New Yorker got impatient at a showing of Howell's moving castle and pushed Coates' son to get by. Coates almost got into a fight to protect his son. This was risky, and a white man even said he would call the police on Coates. Coates learned from this that even though New York City has a lot of different people, it is still a white man's town. Harlem was being gentrified. In order to live the American dream, white people forced black families out of their neighborhoods. At about the same time, Coates became very interested in the Civil War. He took his son to see places from the Civil War, like Petersburg, Shirley Plantation, and others. He knew that America and the South were built on the backs of slaves who picked cotton and kept the economy going. He saw the lasting effects of this injustice everywhere, in his childhood in Baltimore, on his son's face when Eric Garner was killed, and in the anger and shame of a man being kicked out of his home in Chicago. Coates followed the sheriff's officers as they removed the people from the house. He saw the destruction for himself and realized that the same force that killed Prince Jones was dividing and policing the ghetto. It was the dream and the dreamer's way of keeping their idea of perfection alive by keeping black people down. Coates and his family went to France after seeing his wife's photos of the city. He found that the American dream didn't work there because France didn't have the same dark history as the United States, though it did, of course, engage in the slave trade. Coates didn't feel the stress of being a black man in danger and a victim of the American dream in Paris. In the last part of the letter, Coates talks about his visit to Prince's mother, Dr. Mabel Jones. She is a kind, quiet woman who got out of poverty and gave her children everything, nice cars, trips to Europe, and good education. She told Coates that Prince went to private schools his whole life. He made friends wherever he went and probably could have gotten into an Ivy League school. In spite of what she wanted, he chose Howard. Coates writes, I thought about how Prince's loneliness drove him to the Mecca and how neither the Mecca nor we could save him, just as we can't save ourselves in the end. The dream is still strong, and it has given the dreamers the power to steal not just black bodies but also the whole earth. Coates ends the letter with two things, the hope that one day dreamers will wake up and realize how much damage they have caused, and the old fear of the ghettos that reminds him of how vulnerable his black body is. He tells all of this to his son Samori because he wants Samori to grow up to be a man who understands the world around him. Thank you for listening to our book summary. I hope we sparked your interest in the book. Please let us know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. Do you want to listen to more book summaries? Subscribe to us and you will get a notification every time we publish a new summary. Bye bye and see you next time.